Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture, where we continue to discuss Latina feminist testimonials. We begin with Ruth Bahar, who's a Cuban Jewish anthropologist and writer, <clears throat> born in Havana, Cuba, and migrated at the age of five to New York. She attended Wesleyan University and received her PhD in anthropology from Princeton University. She's written several books, including Translated Woman Crossing the Border with Esperanza's Story, An Island Called Home, and Lucky Broken Girl. In the piece called El Beso, we see how Bahar was socialized into a particular racialized and gendered understanding of her sexuality, where not only was she told that she was responsible for whether she allowed herself to be taken advantage of by boys, but also that any boy she chose to be with had to be Cuban and or Jewish, and certainly never Puerto Rican. This piece is reminiscent of the negative stereotypes that exist among the annex groups about Puerto Ricans as discussed in last week's piece by, by uh, Carida Sousa. <clears throat> Her mother also connects intelligence to sexuality, to sexuality, suggesting that she's too smart to allow herself to be taken advantage of by boys and thus insinuating that any girls who do engage in their sexuality aren't as intelligent. These lessons about other Latinx men made her feel hesitant in connecting with other Latina women, which points to the fact that a sisterhood among Latinas is not something that is automatic or should be assumed, but that there are many issues and experiences that hamper solidarity among Latina women. <clears throat> in the next piece, Speaking Among Friends by Luz de Alba Acevedo, she, sh she shares her particular experience in the 1990s when women's studies departments began to engage in what she calls the quote unquote diversity project of diversifying their departments, assuming that all that entailed was hiring people of color and nothing else. She dis discussed the pitfalls of being the token professor of color in her department and how she experienced resistance from students in her courses when she incorporated issues of race and class. She describes the type of feminism in academia she experienced as corporatist feminism, representing a group of middle-class white women who prioritize their positions of power within the institution. And in her piece, she makes a distinction between sisterhood and friendship. <clears throat> and in this quote, she explains, my experience in participating with the Latina feminist group cannot be described as one of sisterhood, but a friendship. I did not experience women bonding on the basis of shared victimization by a common enemy, nor a sense of sisterhood that sought to avoid conflict and minimize disagreements. What I experienced was the kind of friendship built through disagreements, critical discussions, and caring constructive arguments directed to enrich rather than diminish and discredit our personal lives or work. And so she, here she's um, criticizing um, this idea of sisterhood that was very prominent, particularly during uh, the women's movements of the 1970s uh, among white women, where they talked about how all women were sisters and used that as a basis for talking about unity, where women of color, however, um, didn't feel, feel included in those spaces. And so here she's sort of explaining how um, sisterhood sort of assumes a very um, innocent and uh, simplified uh, version of a solidarity, whereas friendship, as she explains it here, um, denotes a much more complicated relationship among women. <clears throat> this week, we have another piece also by Carida Sousa called Missing Body. In this piece, she talks about her missing body to discuss the way she has alienated herself from her body as a response to the various forms of abuse that she experienced throughout her life. She discusses how years of sexual harassment and abuse have had an impact on her relationship with her body. Silence around her experiences adds to the erasure of her body. Her response has been to create layers of protection or to alienate herself from her body. And she acknowledges how as an academic, she continues to inflict abuse onto her body. At the end, she talks about how uh, she inflicts this abuse onto her body by not taking care of it. She, uh, she states, the way I'm compelled to work myself ragged into the ground, the lack of sleep and nutrition to meet deadlines. And so this really invites us to think about and reflect on the ways in which that we don't take care of ourselves. <clears throat> 
and helps uh, us understand the whole self-care movement that has developed in the last few years, really sort of getting us to think about, to take a pause and uh, reflect on the ways in which that we put our bodies last, so to speak, in the midst of everything that we have to do during our days or the people we have to take care of, um, school, work, um, and so on. In this piece, um, I'm Telling to Live by Ines Hernandez Avila. Uh, this piece serves as a response to Susa's piece on her missing body by not only naming the many ways that the abuse is made worse by the lack of support from family members, but also by pointing to ways to achieve healing from the abuse. In particular, how to take back your subjectivity and agency that abusers have attempted to take away. <clears throat> she also distinguishes between two types of silences, the one imposed by society around the stigmas attached to speaking about abuse, and the chosen one where the individual is taking time for themselves to find serenity and calm. This distinction between imposed and chosen silence connects to the Ansaldua quote she references about needing to distinguish between what is imposed, what is inherited, and what is acquired. Finding this quote, she paints a picture of what healing might look like. As we refine our strategies of survival and transformation, we realize how to know and show compassion and forgiveness to ourselves first, then to others. By loving our bodies and our minds, we do honor to our spirits and our hearts. Moving through the grief and the anger, we find the laughter, the smiles, and the female creativity and power that belongs to us. So this ends our lecture for this week. I look forward to uh, reading your thoughts during our discussion post. Have a good week.